times. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Central United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here. Glad you've chosen to, to be with us in worship today physically. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, we see you. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, let us know you're here by making a comment. Uh, on our, if you're watching on Facebook, you can make a comment or you can fill out an online connection card right there on our website where you're, you're filling out there. Um, a couple things for those of us in the room, uh, there is a little sheet of paper, a connection card here. Uh, and if you just want to identify your uh, prayer requests that you have today, you're invited to do that. On the back of that little connection card, there is a spot where you can sign up to help out this Saturday for our Rise Against Hunger, where we're going to be packaging 25,056 meals right here in this space. Uh, we'll do it socially distanced. We'll be doing it in families. As of this morning, we had, uh, early this morning, we had about 62 people who are signed up. So you can choose between 9 and 11 and uh, 11 and 1. So uh, you're invited to come and, and sign up for that. We, you know, I think the fact that we're able to do it in the midst of a pandemic is uh, pretty strong. So thanks for volunteering in advance. Um, if you want to know what's going on here at the church, uh, make sure you take a connection in the back and you can pick up one of those. It has all the things going on in sept of uh, November and December. And lastly, today is uh, Veterans Sunday where we recognize uh, veterans in our church and veterans who are watching online. So uh, if you are, have served as a veteran or you are a veteran, I invite you to stand at this time. And also, if you're doing it online, I invite you to let us know by making a comment. So let's thank uh, those who have served our country. We've come today uh, because we're all here for different reasons, but we've come primarily to worship God. So my hope as we worship today that we would give full attention to God. So I invite you to stand and let's worship the Lord. and honor. Thank you for remaining standing. 
We'll now have the affirmation of faith, 887. Please pray with me. Thank you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor, nor things, things present, nor things to come, nor, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning in person and good morning online. Let us now sit back, let's breathe deeply, and allow the Holy Spirit to enter our being. Heavenly Father, we praise your name this November morning. You are our King and Lord, our God and Savior, our Prince of Peace and our Good Shepherd. Yet with all your magnificence, you love to hear your children sing and you love to hear us pray. May we not disappoint you this morning. May our voices be joyous in song and our prayers be bold in praise. All for your honor. Help us to worship you this morning. Help us to place you above all else in our world so that we may be the church, people, and souls you created us to be. But Father, we confess and open our hearts to you this morning. We must confess of fear that stifles us, of pride that bloats us, of prejudice that blinds us, of ignorance that hobbles us, and of doubt that plagues us. Help us find courage in unlikely places. Help us see our world with new and gracious eyes. Help us move to those places where love is needed. And help us have faith, knowing that you are always with us. Yet for all our faults, we are thankful people and a thankful church. We thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. We thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. Thank you for the hope you give us even during the toughest of times. And thank you for your great love and care. Forgive us, dear Father, when we don't thank you enough. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. We love you. We need you this day and every day, for you alone are worthy. And we pray for your love and compassion to abound as we walk through these challenging seasons. We ask for wisdom for those who bear the load of making decisions with widespread consequences. We pray for those who are suffering with sickness and all who are caring for them. We ask for protection for the elderly and vulnerable so they do not succumb to this virus. 
We pray for financial help for our families affected with job loss and business closures. We pray for misinformation to be curbed and that fear may take no holds in our hearts and minds. As we exercise the good sense that you and your mercy provide, may we also approach each day in faith and peace, trusting in the truth of your good news. Knowing this truth, let us pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Great to see you all here uh, at Central United Methodist Church. My name is Evan Nestor. Um, I am the Director of Family Ministries uh, here for Central. And whether you're in person with us or you're hanging out on your couch at home, uh, we're so grateful to have you with us. And a special good morning to all of our families um, who are watching. You know, um, we, uh, we're in this month of November, right? And all throughout November, our minds are focused on Thanksgiving, right? We're thinking about uh, what it means to be thankful and what it means to be grateful and what that looks like. And today, for our kiddos, I wanted to talk about what it means to have an attitude of gratitude, right? And when I say attitude, I mean kind of like uh, a mindset, who you are, the way you think about life, the way you think about a certain situation. So there's this guy in the Bible named Paul. And Paul, like many of the books that you read, Paul wrote a bunch of books in the Bible, okay? And Paul wrote this specific book called Philippians. Now whether you're hanging out here at church or you're at home, I want you to just say Philippians, okay? So Philippians. So Paul wrote this book to this specific group of people called the Philippians. And Paul actually wrote this book while he was in jail. Now, in today's world, whenever we think about a person who's in jail, usually it's because they've done something that's against the law. Well, way back when, in biblical times, Paul was put in jail because he was a Christian. Paul was put in jail for the very thing that we're here doing today. And right now we're like, that's not a bad thing. Well, back then, kings and, and emperors, they did not look too kindly on Christianity. So Paul is in jail writing this letter to his friends. So let's think about that for a second. If you were in jail, what kind of letter do you think you would be writing to your friends? They probably wouldn't be too great. It'd probably be really hard to be in jail and to write letters to your friends. But in the book of Philippians, Paul had an attitude of gratitude. He had a mindset of thankfulness. In the book, this letter that Paul writes, literally the first verse, Paul says, rejoice. Be happy. Be thankful. That's how Paul starts out this letter in jail. Isn't that crazy to think about that? To have that attitude of gratitude, even in his circumstances, when he didn't do anything wrong except follow Jesus. He's in jail, and he has this attitude of gratitude. So that is our second message for the month of November. As we go throughout our lives, we have to have this attitude of gratitude despite what the world throws at us. Even when things get tough, when we experience hard things, much like Paul did, and he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was grateful for the goodness of Jesus Christ, who loves him, who loves us, who gave himself up. 
for Paul and gave himself up for us. And that's something that we can always be grateful for. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for you. We're grateful for your love that we experience every single day. God, when times get tough, we pray that we have the same mindset as Paul. We're always grateful and we're always rejoicing because we always have your love to fall back on. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Evan. Please join me. We're going to share our prayers for our offertory. Uh, In-house, we do have plates at the back. There's three ways we can give, one in the back. For our online people, you can go to our website. And at the very top, there's a little button that says Give. Uh, you press that, and you'll be able to uh, walk through the steps on that. And then also, if you want to send uh, your offering to the office, again, our address has changed. Please pray with me. Dear Holy Father, you give so much to us. You give so much in material, in faith, in home, in food, in love. You give us what we need. May we find it in ourselves to come back and give you more. Give you more than you have given us. Give it to you for your church so that it may be blessed on people and things for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Sharon Yarbrough will now share scripture with us. I shall read from Luke 19, 41 through 44, NIV version. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you ever, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. That's what we're going to be looking at today. I want to welcome you once again here, and I want to welcome those online who are watching and participating online. We, we see you. We're glad you're here. And uh, I know with rising cases, some of you are still hunkering down, and we totally get that. So I uh, just want to say glad you're with us today. Um, they say, you know, maybe you've heard me say this before. Do you know the best three sounds in church? The best three sounds are chairs that are being set up, which is not going to be happening with us physically here because we're all laid out. The second best sound is when people tear their checkbooks and put money in the offering plate. Now, most times people are, you've done this online already, so maybe uh, we don't hear that sound. But the third best sound is actually something we've gotten to hear today. It's the sound of children. It's the sound of newborns. So we're grateful for Anne Lucille and for Samuel Morgan who are with us today. They're, uh, Samuel's first Sunday with us. So 
we're glad that you're here. Uh, today we're going to be looking at this idea, uh, which is really a, a simple introduction. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Maybe this was something when you were younger to prove the fact that, yeah, I memorized Scripture. I know the shortest Scripture in the Bible, uh, Jesus wept. Well, today we're going to look at the second occurrence of this passage of Jesus wept in the Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to Luke uh, chapter uh, 19, where we're going to look at that. And as always, you can access the sermon notes as you would like. Uh, just to uh, say what I'm going to try to cover in this section is, why did Jesus weep? Why did Jesus weep? And how can this be a pathway for us to grow spiritually? I don't know about you, but I need additional pathways to grow spiritually. I can't just push play and make it happen. And I want you to see through this text how this can be a pathway to that. So let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege that we have of worshiping in person or online. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you can speak to us no matter where we're at for the things which pertain to the message or the things which don't pertain to the message but are on our hearts today. And we pray, Jesus, that we may know you better as a result of this, of this text today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Throughout this uh, time, this fall, we've been looking at good news, and as we've been doing that, I want you to really think, uh, we've been talking about Jesus called a ministry. We began about two months ago. We looked at his miracles that he did, and now what we're doing is we're turning towards really the end of his life, the thing that the scriptures, depending upon the, the scripture passage, take a, a third to a half of his life to talk about this final week of his life. And so we're looking at this passage from uh, Luke chapter 19. And just to, to set it up just a hair before him is just to say that um, this is a passage that we would normally think chron chronologically if we've grown up in the church is the, happened at the same day as Palm Sunday. Because there would have been a gathering of, this, of these uh, disciples and Jesus. He's on a, a cult which hadn't been written to fulfill the scriptures. And he's literally in uh, uh, the Mount of Olives. He's coming down the Mount of Olives and going to go up to Jerusalem knowing what his fate is going to be. And this is what happens just before um, he goes down the hill and goes up to um, what we consider the triumphal entry. In verse 41, it says this. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. He wept over the city. Notice the cause and effect which happens in this. He saw the city and therefore he began to weep. Now there's different levels of weeping, isn't there? There's levels of being sad. We've all been sad at times of things that have happened to us in our life. Maybe things we've done or things external. I think most of us have shed tears. We've cried. We've, we've been sad. But then there's a deeper level of weeping that is more than just a quiet tear. It's an audible sound that people can hear. Certainly the disciples heard Jesus weeping. And it wasn't just a, qu a quiet cry, it was an audible sound. Now, I don't know about each one of you, but most of us have had things in our lives which have made us sad and have made us weep. I was thinking this week, imagine you were in love with someone for your whole life, and that person made a choice that they would not be in a relationship with you. And instead, they decided, I'm going to file for divorce. And I'm drawing the line. And you decide, I'm going to try to reach out. I love this person. I, I, I love them with my whole heart. Yet all they do is continue to act like you're dead. They don't communicate with you. Every time you reach out to them, they don't respond. That is sort of what is happening in this text. Because the nature of the whole 
story of the Bible is the feet of God is continually reach out to his people, and yet they reject him. And Jesus feels that even here as he weeps over the city. So my question to us today is, how is this good news? How is Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem good news for us on November 8th, 2020? I want to share a couple things with you as I thought about this passage of how this is good news to us. The first one is this. I want to remind you of something I said three months ago, which if you can remember, I give you an applaud. Uh, but me, you may have slept since then. The first thing I want you to remember is our God is a God of emotion. Our God is a God of emotion. He feels what we feel. He knows when we feel joy and we feel sadness and when we feel rejection. And this is how, this is good news because God knows how we feel. Sometimes we picture God as kind of an old man, an old, usually a white man wearing robes up in the sky, and he's kind of removed from us. And he doesn't know what's going on in our lives. But the message of the gospel is he does. He knows what we feel. In fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And so when Jesus shows tears and emotion, this is good news because our God feels. That is good news. Second thing I want to say is um, Jesus wept because he knew suffering was coming to the people of Israel. And God does not want suffering to come. We see this in verses 42 through 44. Hear it again. And Jesus said, If you, even you, would have only known on this day what would bring you peace. In other words, I've come to bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies shall build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. See, Jesus had eyes to see. He saw what was going to happen 40 years in advance. Then roughly 69 to 70 AD, Rome was going to swoop in because of rebellion of the people of Israel. They were going to literally hem them in on every side. They would cut off their water supply and eventually... Because of their rebellion against Rome, they were going to pay. And historian uh, Tacitus records that one million people died when uh, Jerusalem was burned to the ground. Just think that holy city where at the very top, the temple mount, where God uniquely interacted with his people is where heaven and earth coincided. That place was wiped off the face of the map. And the stones were thrown down. And uh, literally 95,000 people, according to Roman history, were the, kind of the cream of the crop of the people of Israel were exported to Rome to, to serve the rest of their days. But think about it. A million people died. And Jesus looks at that time, roughly 30 A.D., looks, aha looks ahead and realizes that is the fate of of the people of Israel because they did not respond to me. And this is not something that God enjoys. Instead, it breaks his heart. God doesn't want his people to suffer, yet he recognizes judgment is in response to the rejection of God. But the heart of God is he doesn't want people to suffer. He doesn't want us to suffer. That's not part of his DNA. And the third thing is I think about this text and how this is good news is the good news is that Jesus wants to reach out to each one of us and is actively wanting us to recognize him. Notice that last verse of scripture. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. How good are you are at recognizing God's presence and God's coming to you. 
Jesus realized that in a few moments he was going to go down the Mount of Olives, go into Jerusalem, and he'd be around crowds and throngs of people who would not recognize that God was there. The moment they had been waiting for, a Messiah was coming, and they didn't catch it. They didn't recognize it. I wonder how many times we don't recognize God's coming to us when he comes to us. One of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of John Ortberg. And he wrote a book a number of years ago called God is Closer Than You Think. And he shares an illustration which I think is so helpful for us as we think about how this can be a pathway to recognizing God's presence. And he compares two works of art. And here is the first work of art that he compares to us. You'll see it here on the screens. Do you know what that picture is? It is the Sistine Chapel. It is the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And do you know who painted this? Michelangelo. I always want you to get your money's worth at church. So just to tell you, it took him 20 years to paint that. And those of you who know this, at the very center of, the, um, of, of this uh, place at the Vatican is this picture. And notice we had to do a little creative editing with that picture, all right? Uh, but with that picture, it sort of presents the gospel in a picture, doesn't it? You see God being strong, uh, reaching out with everything that he has, just to touch human beings, touch Adam. And here you see the Adam here who's got some pretty strong muscles there, I can see in that, in that one. All Adam has to do is simply lift a finger and he can encounter God. All he's got to do is lift a finger and he can experience God. And I doubt, I doubt, or I should say, my guess is many of you have heard sermons kind of on this idea. All you got to do is simply lift a finger. God is reaching out to you. All you got to do is respond. And that is true. God is way closer than we can think. Yet Ortberg shares something that I can identify with. And perhaps you can identify with too. Because perhaps some of you have made an effort to lift the finger. Maybe you've reached out in some way and you've reached out to God and you still don't know where he is. And he shares a second image which I think is helpful for us as we think about the presence of God. And here's the second image. The second image, you know who that is, right? Humor me because I need a little interaction. Who is that? It is Where's Waldo? That, Where's Waldo has, uh, there's been 40 million books sold from Where's Waldo in 28 different countries. And if you know anything about Where's Waldo, he's kind of a geeky looking guy, but he's kind of, uh, he stands out in the crowd, but does he stand out in the crowd? And in the books of the Where's Waldo books, it starts off with kind of a simple, um, a simple one. So let me show you this next picture. It starts off easier, which you might say, hey, I can barely see the screen. Where's Waldo in this picture? Uh, I'll let you go back later to try to find out where he is. But he is in here. He's just a little harder to find. But there's not too many things going on as compared to this next picture. Check out the next picture. Much harder to find Waldo here. When you're looking in these books, you'll find there are a lot of counterfeits, right? There's a lot of red. There's people who wear hats. And it's much harder to find. And Ortberg puts it this way. He puts it this way. Let every day, every moment of your life be another page. Sometimes God is easy to find. You just can't help but catch it. And sometimes God seems a lot more elusive. His presence, it's much harder to find. And it takes a well-trained eye that with discernment and experience to find him. I identify with that. 
One of the things I've been thinking about the past few weeks is um, uh, many times I am on spiritual autopilot. And I can just kind of go about my day or my week. I can have my devotions. I can say my prayers. But I'm not really attentive to the presence of God. Maybe you can feel that way too. There's so much going on in our world, so much information coming at us, and all you want to do is kind of numb yourself and kind of put on a blanket and, and distract yourself at times. And I'm trying to tell myself, how can I recognize God's presence? And I've been thinking about it particularly on Sunday mornings. Where is God's presence on a Sunday morning? I want to tell you a couple stories from this past couple weeks. About two weeks ago, if you were here, we celebrated our Commitment Sunday where we consecrated our commitments to God. And um, there was a moment in this service that I became aware of God and it really helped me. If you were here that day, you might remember we sang, Here I Am, Lord, the choir uh, individuals in the choir sang. And then on the third verse, the choir stood up and they sang, Here I am, Lord. And for me, there was a moment. There was a moment in the service where some of you in this room stood up. And I don't think it was just because the choir stood up, I think it was because of the words. When you sang or you participated, whatever, uh, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave me. I felt like some of you, when you stood up and more and more people stood up, I felt like it was a moment where you were rededicating yourself to God. And it inspired me that that's what I need to do. I need to start recognizing his presence. Last week, if you were with us last week, on, uh, at 3 o'clock, we had a number of people gather here to, to pray for our country, for the election, and for this week. And I know you'll continue to pray. But even as we prayed, and it was lasted maybe 45 minutes, I felt the Spirit of God here. I felt like God was with us. And then just yesterday... I was, uh, we were at our house, we did some different things during the day, and then uh, at night we had uh, some family over, and one of uh, our family members is uh, my nephew named Connor, and I asked Connor, I said, Connor, um, we have a little book of prayer, can you pick out a prayer for us to pray for the meal time? And it's probably four pages of prayers, Connor's about nine years old. Connor looked through the prayer book and he, he said, I like this one. And so we all got together and we had some pizza and some Joe's Italian. And um, Connor prayed for us from that prayer. And I felt the presence of God there. Are you recognizing the presence of God and it's working in your life? Do you sense what he's doing? Or do you, are you on autopilot? Or maybe it's simply, it's just like one of those hard Where's Waldo pages. He's there. It's just really hard to find. And you have to act in faith. And you have to hang in there a little bit longer. One other thing I want to say about this Jesus wept. Which, by the way, you can now memorize scripture. Jesus wept. If anybody asks you, you can tell them, I know some scripture. Jesus wept. If they ask you where it is in the Bible, say John chapter 11, and you can search it out for yourself. But I want to say this about Jesus wept one last thing, because I think it can be a pathway for us spiritually. Because why did Jesus weep again? Jesus wept because he could see things that the disciples couldn't see. He had a, a different view of reality than the disciples. And I think this can be a pathway for us, honestly, to say, God, would you give me some eyes to see what you see? So, for example, if you go out of your neighborhood, wherever you live, 
and you look around those who live around you? What does God see there? Ask him, help me to see God. If you come to church or you're, uh, you're at church, where are you, God? Help me to recognize you. If you go to work, whether you work remotely or whether you work physically, where are you at work, God? How can I join you in what you're doing? Or if you watch the news, and I'm sure none of you watch the news this week, right? If you watch the news, did you say, where are you, God? Did you recognize how God's working? Have faith and believe that God is working. But number two, ask God, give me eyes to see you. Because I have blinders on, I need your help. This can be a pathway for you and for me if we ask God to open up our eyes so that we can see. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your presence here. For even the times when we can feel it tangibly and the times when we find it difficult, we believe that you are with us. Your word says where two or three come together in your name, that you are with them. So we ask you, God, we ask you, Jesus, that you would help us to see you. Help us to see the world in which we live from your perspective and help us to be the hands and feet to our own prayers, to be the kind of people we need to be in the world. But we ask that you would get, get us, God, if we're on spiritual autopilot, that you would break us out of that. Help us to see and to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I want to welcome, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to give the benediction in a second. And after I give the benediction, I'm going to have this section here to head out to the, the gathering area. And if you'd like to visit, you're welcome to do that outside. We're trying to limit that happening in the building. And after this section goes, I'll dismiss you all. Remember, as you go, you can pick up a connection uh, newsletter to see what's going on. It has all of our dates for Christmas. And then next week, just to remind you, is our Thanks for Giving Sunday where we recognize people in our church who have served in an extraordinary way, and it's, it's a surprise to them. So we invite you to uh, tune in if you're watching or to be here physically for next week's service. I invite you to stand at this time. As you leave today and as we leave today, May you have been filled by the presence of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit, 
And may you be a blessing to all those that you encounter this day and always. Amen. God bless you.